Crown Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Chris Kilbert. We're glad that you have joined us this morning. We want to mention a few things as we get started. Uh, we, if you haven't heard, we are doing the Hero Baskets. That's a new ministry of the church that's being arranged through the deacons. And one way that you're able to do that is by bringing certain items for those baskets. But what are those baskets for? Uh, this is a way that we can share the love of Jesus Christ and show our thanks for those in our community who over the past year and a half have offered their time and their service, their expertise, their energy uh, to those who have struggled in various ways through COVID. So we want to show our appreciation for that. So we're creating these hero baskets. They're going to start being made first for some teachers in our community and then going on to first responders and medical professionals. But it's a simple thing that you can do. Just bring in snacks, gum, lotion, uh, hand sanitizer, chapstick, pens, other kinds of just little things to show our appreciation. And again, there is a bin in the church narthex right outside the sanctuary for those items. So we want to we thank you in advance for that. Also, coming up in a few weeks, uh, you may have missed it last year. I certainly did. One of, uh, one of our favorite kind of get-togethers is our ice cream social. And we're, we're reinstituting that. So on August 29th, Sunday, August 29th at 6 o'clock p.m., we're going to have it outside with good weather. Uh, we'll go back inside if not, but we're planning on having it outside. And we're going to have what we typically do, the hot dogs with the fixins and the homemade ice cream. And then following the time of, of food, we're going to have our, our special guests, our, our beloved friends, uh, Bluegrass Harmony. They're going to be performing. So we hope you can join us for this time of food and music and fellowship and fun and invite plenty of friends. Invite a bunch of folks and bring your favorite lawn chair and we're just going to celebrate the gifts that God has given us. Speaking of gifts, we've been doing our, our spiritual gift series, uh, Serving with Joy series. We're wrapping that up this morning. We want to let you know, I mentioned a couple times about a spiritual gift assessment. That even through the uh, identifying, discovering, unwrapping, developing, using of our gifts through this series, there still may be that sense where I just don't know exactly what my spiritual gifts are. And you want to be able to know those so that you can use those faithfully. So what we're encouraging our congregation to do, our River Launchers family, and all those who may be watching, we're going to be providing a spiritual gift assessment, a discovery tool, so to speak, so that you're able to, to just prayerfully uh, discern through God's word, through brothers and sisters in Christ, through this tool, uh, how God has gifted you and how he's calling you to use those gifts for his service. So well, there'll be more on that to come. We'll be presenting or offering copies of that in the back of the sanctuary, as well as putting it out as an email blast. We want to make sure you have an opportunity to see that. We'll probably put it also on our church website too. All right, so we have come into the and to this place, uh, and we are in many places, but in one is spirit to offer our love, express our love to our God in worship as we come united in the spirit of God. So let's come before our Lord in prayer. Let's pray to you. Lord, we, we come, and we come from many places, and we are situated in many places, but we thank you that by the power of your spirit, the gift of your spirit, you have united us, and that you are with us. So, Lord, may we acknowledge that wonderful truth that the God of the universe is with us here. Lord, may we enter your presence and lift up our voices and offer our lives, hear your word, respond in faith. May your spirit empower and impassion us to live for your glory. May you begin now. We pray this in Jesus' name. So let us sing unto our, our Lord, come, Christians, join us.
go before the Lord. Let's come before him in humble, uh, not only adoration, but also confession, acknowledging our great need and also his great supply. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you, too often we may have a small idea of what pride is, of what idolatry is, so small that it doesn't impact what we are, how we are living. So we don't recognize, we don't acknowledge, we don't confess those places of pride and idolatry in our lives. And so, Lord, we pray by the power of your spirit, the illumination of your spirit, shed light on those places where we have lived for self, not for you and not for others. That we may be able to identify and confess that you root out those places and things in our lives that have taken priority over you, where our devotion, our dedication, our focus have been. And as a result of that, where we have fallen short in our witness, in our love, where we have been instead judgmental or prejudiced or, or filled with anger and hate and violence, with jealousy or bitterness, greed, envy. Lord, you've called us to follow you and not these things. And we can't do it in our own power and strength. So we humble ourselves before you, acknowledging our great need for you, trusting in your great provision in Christ Jesus. So forgive us, restore us, empower us, and use us for your purpose. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And hear this good news. From Romans 8. Five, Romans 5, 8, and Romans 6, 11, and 14. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, for you and me. And so in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. This is the good news of the gospel. Thanks be to God. As we continue to worship, we enter into this time of of hearing the word of the Lord, as we're seeking to understand and grow, not only in our giftedness, but also as the body of Christ, with many members, with those gifts, to edify, to serve, to draw people's attention and praise to our one great God. So let's turn to God's word. We come again to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We looked at the first few verses last week. um, And we're going to overlap. We're going to read some of those verses again and then the uh, verses that follow. So 1 Corinthians 3 beginning in verse 5. Let's prepare our hearts to hear God's word. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they each will be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me?
Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So let me ask, let me start with a question. Do you like working as part of a team? Or do you tend to like to work on a project, a task by yourself? Do you lean toward one more than the other? Now, both can be productive, right? After all, God has made each of us uniquely a certain way where we may flourish in one environment, but we may feel stifled in another. And so the Lord does use us in our giftedness in a variety of ways and sometimes that will be that individual endeavor right or a one-on-one -on -one opportunity but when it comes to being the church the family of god the body of christ teamwork is the overwhelming model commended to us in god's word and sometimes we tend to forget that or neglect that that we are called to gather, to not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, as we hear in Hebrews, that there is that gathering so that there can be that scattering. And we are the members of the body, parts of that body, and we have to do that as a team. That's another image that we're given. We see the body, we see the building, and so we see all of these corporate pictures of how the, the church is to be. So in today's passage, Paul is trying to get the Corinthians to become a team that works effectively for building the kingdom of God. That's what this cooperative corporate model is to accomplish. So they were gifted people. We've established that. In fact, they did not fall short in any gift, but they just hadn't learned how to best use those gifts, faithfully use those gifts and those abilities for the good of all and the glory of God. And some would say, I follow Apollos' teaching. I follow Paul's, right? Well, what did all that mean? Again, that seems so distant. That's the, their culture, what was happening in their context. Well, you may be familiar with Paul the Apostle. We're not as familiar with this guy named Apollos. And we may think, wasn't that a Greek god? No, that's Apollo. Close, though. But Apollos, on the other hand, was a Jewish man, one of those earliest Christians. We hear about him in Acts 18. And like Paul, he was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, which is the call of, of every elder, every leader in the church. He spoke with great fervor and taught with, about Jesus accurately. You see that balance? There is to be that knowledge, loving with all the Lord with all your mind, but also that passion. They go hand in hand. One without the other can be very, very dangerous. So Apollos may have even been bolder than Paul when it came to his witness, when it came to teaching. We're told that he vigorously, there that is again, that we're vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now it's okay to be vigorous, but we need to be vigorous for the right reasons, passionate for the right reasons. Are they for our own self-centered reasons, or is it to proclaim Jesus as the Christ? Passionate about him and the gospel and the kingdom of God. So there's a big difference. So both these men were serving the Lord faithfully. Both knew the word. Both were fervent in their witness. Both drew a crowd. They each had qualities of a leader. And so the people followed. This sounds great, right? They're doing, doing great work for the Lord. People are, are, are believing in the teaching. The problem was, though, for many of these followers, the focus became that leader rather than Jesus. The mouthpiece rather than the master. And this led to a lot of bickering among those who claimed the title of Christian. So they really weren't focusing on the gift giver. We talked about that last week too, the importance of focusing on the giver and not the gifts. And instead of focusing on the giver, they were focusing on those evident receivers, Paul and Apollos. And because of this, they weren't able to channel their own gifts to their best use. They weren't able to do that. Some were inclined to think that they were more important than others, that their work was more influential, and whether they did it intentionally or not, they were devaluing 
the work of others. And so Paul in our, our passage is responding to this. Again, I quoted his response last week. He tells them, you are acting like worldly people. You're acting like you're still in the world. Like nothing's changed. You're not acting like those who have been born and led by the Spirit. Like we're called to a different life. And so Paul uses illustrations from agriculture. Just like Jesus uses parables to teach and compare, here's Paul using illustrations of agriculture to help them understand how teamwork operates. Again, we mentioned this last week as well when we read about Jesus. He used it as well, describing himself as the vine, the father as the gardener. And so that means we're the branches. As part of the life-giving vine, we are connected and we need each other to carry Christ's love. We need each other to be fruitful in our giftedness. And, you know, I think when we think about the vine and the branches, we think of ourselves as a branch and Jesus is the vine, and we think it's this one-way communication where I just need to remain and abide in him and, and he sustains me. That's not the picture. A vine has many branches, and we can't forget that we are also connected to the body and that we're to be supporting one another and working with one another. Never forget that aspect of it. Okay? So it's good. It's good that we're uh, able to, to emphasize that. So let's consider how important teamwork is in accomplishing God's purposes in this world. Because we are God's team. But what does that mean? What does that look like? And are we living up to it? So three things. First of all, willingness is required. And that's been a major theme throughout this series. You have, you have to start with willingness. Many believers today prefer not to be part of a team. And that's the focus today is that corporate element, teamwork, and the use of our giftedness. But many don't really like being part of a team. And this could be for lots of reasons. You might just enjoy working on a project from start to finish. You have a sense of accomplishment about that, right? Or you might... Be a creative person who gets satisfaction from seeing one part unfold and then move on to another. That's great. Those are good things. On the other hand, many things in the work of God are just too big for us to do alone. They're not designed for us to do alone. The resources are not there for an individual to make that necessary impact. Because God didn't design it that way. He wants the church. He calls the church to be one and to, and, and to be those members of the body with those gifts. There was once a gifted young man named Donald Carpenter who could play football like very few could. His sophomore year in high school, he made all city team. His junior year, he made all state unanimous choice. It was obvious by his senior year that he was going to turn the place upside down, that he was home free. But the coach made a tragic mistake. In summer practice before senior year, he changed all the plays so that they keyed around Donald Carpenter. And the team virtually was, was to revolve around, around him. Everything went fine. Everything went fine for five games. And then into that fifth game, he broke his ankle. And that changed everything. They were, before they could hardly be scored upon. But now, the latter part of that season was not much to brag about. The team lost everything. Why? Because they weren't functioning as a team, but as a one man show, right? So I have to say, you know, I, like meant some folks, may have a little bit of time relating to that. I was never a star athlete. I wasn't really interested in trying out for sports that were based mainly on competition because of not being able to, to be as strong in those categories. And I knew that for me, I, I wouldn't really be able to feel like a part of the team. Now that's just one reason people may shy away from being part of a team. And, and I'm not just talking about sports. Sports is often a common one, but I'm talking about many other ways too. Many people may stay away from joining a team effort because of the negative experiences that they have faced. What kind of negative experiences have you faced as you've worked as part of a team? Because we're all sinners. We, we tend, I'm sure there's been others who've gotten on your nerves and we've gotten on their nerves, right? Um, Paul's examples of people in the Corinthian church could be similar to what we've experienced. 
where there's been grumbling and arguing and bickering and, and comparing. Now, Princess, you may have been on a committee where personalities clashed, and you said, if I ever get off this committee, I'm never going on another one again. We think it's just going to be the same experience, and I don't want that. I'm going to stay away from that at all costs. Or maybe it's happened at work, that you've been put in a position that involves team projects. And it's almost like you know, it's a reward to you because they put their trust in you and know that you can be part of that team. You've proven your worth by coming through on things. And so now others, others around you really kind of expect you to pick up their slack. They don't say it. They just kind of act that way, taking advantage of you again and again. That happens in school, too. School projects, you know, uh, working as teams, they tend to go uh, expect those who've performed academically better to pull the weight. And so such experiences don't really foster a future willingness to be part of a team. They tend to want us, again, be those individuals pursuing what we think is best. And, and I think the enemy can sometimes really like that because it keeps us from being what we've been called to be. Too often we prefer to be those loners in order to avoid those differing opinions and those conflicts, to avoid people who seem to feel self-important and prideful, uh, to really not have to deal with people who seem to know it all and who are insensitive to uh, the other members of the team who just are abrasive with their personality, uh, right? We, we, we may feel ignored or unappreciated. All kinds of ways we've probably experienced this one way or another. And sometimes we just don't like the work that we're assigned to do on the team, that we're not willing to do it. So there's all kinds of reasons why we may not be too excited about being on the team. There was an editor of a newspaper who had been informed that power lines were down after a recent hurricane. And so he assigned two reporters to the story, and he said, this has just happened, power company hasn't been out, no one knows whether the wires are live or not, but this story is really important. We need to make sure we get it right. So one of you is to touch the wire and the other is to write the story. Now, I seriously doubt that's true, because if that was true, that editor probably didn't have a job for much longer. But the whole point of that, of trying to emphasize, is that uh, sometimes a willingness to work together can be tricky. It can be tricky, sometimes seemingly impossible. How, how, could we, how could you ask someone to do such a thing? Well, see, the emphasis again there is how do we work together in a way where we grow and others grow. But why, we should ask, why is teamwork so needed? Why, why is it needed? Why is it so important to do it this way? Well, we've already mentioned that individual resources are so often not enough, that cooperative efforts generally result in achievements far greater than the individual can do in isolation, both because of the different gifts and insights and perspectives that the, those uh, individuals bring, but also to share the load, being able to carry part of the work as far as time and energy. There's many reasons why that is ex uh, there's exponential in that area. So let's consider this more closely in our chapter. Paul emphasizes cooperation toward mutual goals, that there's a purpose behind this, right? He refers to teamwork with another metaphor, another illustration, as a building, right? That we are God's building. And he talks about himself and his activity. He says, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. In other words, it's our job now. There's this transition, this succession. The church continues to grow in and out and up. You know, this organism is organic and God uses us and it continues to build, right? It's our job now. Our cooperative efforts will continue for years to come, but we need to stick together if we're going to realize that final end, that product. We have to look for ways where we can help one another to use our gifts. And we may be tempted to, to again, think about the use of our gifts with others that we have in the past used our gifts. You know, we can tend to be groupies, where we kind of have our cliques and we work with those that we've worked with in the past. But we need to remember others in the body of Christ to make room for the new kid on the block, so to speak, to make room for those newcomers to gain experience and expertise in their giftedness 
as they join the team. So we must stick together as we build one another up, as we hear all those one another passages of Paul, building one another up, encouraging one another. Right? We need to build one another up instead of tearing down or crowding off the team. We need to be intentional. We need to be aware of what our actions are doing. So how important are you in the team effort? More so than you probably think. Just think about all these dimensions. A rooster without a hen, no baby chicks. Kellogg's, <laughs> without that farmer equals no cornflakes. If a nail factory closes, what good is the hammer factory? You see all these kinds of comparisons. The most skillful surgeon can't perform uh, that skill without the ambulance driver who delivers the patient. Even the lone ranger had Tonto, one of the greatest, I don't know, oxymorons ever. It's like, how is he the lone ranger? Tonto's always there. But <laughs> the idea is that you need someone and someone needs you. God designed it that way. So we've covered the why. One more thing is the how. I think we often think about that the most. How are we going to do this? How do we become useful members of God's team? Doing this corporatively. God's work involves many different individuals with a variety of gifts and abilities. And on one level, that can be challenging. That can be exhausting. But when it's done right, when, when we surrender to the work of the Spirit and act out of patience and the other fruit of the Spirit, love, self-control, uh, we see a very different picture. So God's work involves all these different individuals. There's, we have to realize we're, there's no superstars in the task. Team members performing their own unique special roles that God has given them. So as we become useful members of God's team, this is how we do it. By setting aside our desire to receive glory and praise for what we do. Now again, you may think, I don't desire glory and praise. I want God to have the glory. I'm not all, you know, I don't, I don't, I need, I don't know, this kind of puffed up sense of myself. It takes on many different forms, though. You know, we, we, we like to be affirmed and appreciated and recognized. We feel slighted or spurned if uh, it just goes unnoticed, when, especially if someone else gets, the, gets that. It's just deep down inside of us, right? Some might say, if I'm not recognized, if I'm not appreciated, why should I do anything? And Paul is telling the Corinthians, are you on God's team? It's God's team. Yeah. They... they then don't seek the, the praise that comes from people. That's what we shouldn't be. Why should we be seeking that? What's the point of that? It's worthless compared to God's affirmation. In all things, we're to seek his approval, that we serve and live and worship our God. We, we have this audience of one. Okay? Paul told them that as long as they really grabbed at what made them look important, they would remain immature. We gotta, we gotta get past ourselves. We're never gonna be able to grow. We're never gonna be able to function well together. We're never gonna be able to serve our community. We're never gonna be able to further the kingdom of God if we're grabbing for that, uh, that, that really serves our ends. So we need to know that place that God has placed us. We need to know the purpose that he's given us. We must remember that we are the garden. He is the gardener. That no matter how many seeds of service and witness we may give, we're not the master sower. It is God who makes things grow. We have to depend upon him in all those circumstances. Paul was good at planting those churches. Apollos was good at nurturing the people in the faith. But if the spirit of God had not been in the midst of it, nothing would have happened. It would have amounted to nothing. Verse 8 says, The person who plants and waters has one purpose, and will be rewarded according to their labor. Notice it doesn't say their success. Right? You might not always see great success in your work, at least how the world defines success. And you may know about, read about certain Christians, popular writers, powerful speakers who've helped thousands upon thousands grow closer to the Lord, grow in their faith. And you think, I work faithfully, and I do I don't see any kind of that success. Am I doing something wrong? Is, is it really worth even pursuing? You know, what, what can I offer in comparison to that? And so, again, the enemies say, yeah, you should just give up. This is for somebody else. 
when that's not true. Paul reminds us that it's, it's not about our so-called success rate uh, that the world says. It's about our faithfulness. Our faithfulness in using the particular gifts that our God has given us. And so we need to ask ourselves, are we using our gifts in a labor of love? Is that the motivation behind the use of our gifts? Love. Love for Christ and love for others. Our love for those around us. Are we working faithfully as part of God's team as an extension of that love of Christ in us? Yeah, so one plants, another waters. One prepares a Bible study. Another plants a, uh, plants a potluck. One visits a shut-in. One visits uh, a family in the neighborhood uh, who just moved in. Maybe not, does it? have a church maybe doesn't know the Lord so we all have that ultimate same purpose we are one in aim our work is this cooperative effort so when you are on the verge of being discouraged keep your eyes on that overall plan not on the individual bits and pieces see I think those are two things that I struggle with one is you can be so much focused on all the little things that need to get done right now, the bits and pieces, that you become overwhelmed and frustrated because you don't see the, the worth or the purpose of it all, especially with all that the, the demands as far as your energy and time. But when you think of the long-term vision, the plan, the kingdom of God work, you'll be encouraged. And in connection to that, to know that it's not just you doing it. It's not just you responsible for it. You have the spirit of the living God and you have the body of Christ. And that we do this together. We need to remember those things. For when God's work is done in God's way, for God's glory, it will never lack God's supply. Okay? God is not obligated to support our self-centered schemes. But he is dedicated to support his ministry. His work. And when we do our work faithfully as part of God's team... When we work to give him the glory, we know that one day we'll be able to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. So may that be our motivation, our joy, our end, offering our giftedness for God's glory, sharing those gifts graciously, deliberately, sacrificially, that we may grow up in Christ, that we may attain full maturity in the faith, that we serve this community in our midst, that we expand the kingdom of God, and that we do it all to the praise of his holy name. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you will reveal not only our giftedness and that by your spirit instill in us confidence and boldness and willingness, but also that we will have the humility and wisdom to acknowledge and live into your call, that we are to use that giftedness as an extension, a part of your body, as part of that team, for your kingdom and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. As we continue to worship, we think of another way that we are able to use our gifts graciously and deliberately and sacrificially in service to our community. And that's through our tithes and through our offerings. So again, we want to thank all those who have continued to send in their giving as we seek to continue to, to honor the Lord in, in the work that he's given us and that we do so as the body of Christ together. So we'll be dedicating that in, in our time of prayer together. We're going to come to a time of prayer in just a moment. We want to let you know if you have a joy, a thanksgiving, uh, something that has happened that you want to share and give glory to God and to share with the church to, to lift up and encourage the body and to give God praise for what he's done. Let's, let us know that and we'll be happy to share it on your behalf. Also, if you have a, a concern, a burden, a struggle yourself, or if you know someone else and you ask if they would like uh, that to be shared, you're welcome to share that with us and we're, we're happy, happy to lift that as well. Because we're the body, right? We, 
We rejoice with those who rejoice, and we suffer with those who suffer, and we pray for one another. So let's do that now. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you again, and we put our trust in you. We are dependent upon you. We are in great need, and you are the one who provides. Lord, today many of us are tired. We're tired of the circumstances uh, that we are facing, maybe for a very long time. Circumstances that often lie to us and distract us from the promise that you have for us. So Lord, today we are choosing to trust your word over our lives, over our situations. Lord, we know that not one word from your mouth will return void. That although things may look lifeless, we are confident that you can bring them to life again. Lord, we love you and we wait for your promise. We pray this in the name of Christ, our Savior Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Church Slough, let us sing. Of this glorious truth, this gift that God has given us, Jesus calls us. We want to thank you for worshiping with us today and that as we depart, we know that we go on in our lives to continue that worship. Right? The worship doesn't end here, that our lives are an expression, an offering to the Lord. So remember that as we close with this benediction, this blessing from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 16. May our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. May he strengthen you to use your gifts for his glory as part of God's family, his team, his body. Go forth to share the love of Christ 
and the good news of the gospel. Amen and amen. Thank you for worshiping.